Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Um, happy to be here. I will do my utmost effort not to speak too quickly for the translators. Start screaming if I or wave or whatever. Let me know. Uh, growing up in the Caribbean, you learn how to speak very quickly. When I was looking at this question of policy alignment and security, I was trying to figure out how to best approach this subject. It's very tough. And it's counterintuitive for many people who are focused on in the realms of ministries of defense, the military, and police. So what I'd like to do is take it from a kind of a very high level and then pull it down to how it may have a direct bearing in terms of your daily activities, but still something that requires you to consider a lot of things. Now, we know that nothing survives in a vacuum, and very few things work in isolation. And this applies to security. We also, what I've also seen is that the education and training of security personnel, particularly the military, is often done in a very linear fashion that mirrors the tactical outlook to operations and strategy. And this is a mistake. This is particularly a problem for many, if not most, African militaries that have an internal security role and responsibility. Now, when we talk about security, security of the state, I think it has to be viewed in three manners, three forms. It's, 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 it's three-dimensional, it's multidisciplinary, and intertemporal. And why I say why? Why, why, why? why would you look at it that way? And I think if one deconstructs the definition of what is a state, and at the elemental level, you see that the state is people, a bunch of people, a lot of people who come together for political, cultural, linguistic, historical, and geographic regions, and for a variety of other reasons. And the institutions of the state have a direct responsibility for the welfare and protection of the populace. All the institutions. And however, no one institution can achieve this mission by itself. So, general th view. Now this seems self-evident, but very few security institutions tend to look beyond their specific area of responsibility, their AOR. And sadly for many governments, state security usually means regime security, which in my view is the protection of ruling elites from the country's citizens. And such a limited perspective usually fails. Now, can one have security, state security without economic or social development progress? Can a military meet its mission when the social conditions of its citizens are deteriorating or not improving? In the constant scramble for resources, one should consider taking a broader view to security. Military budgets with their associated large procurements for equipment and materiel and personnel costs often compete for the same government revenues needed for education, public health, youth, and employment spending. And so the question is, if, the, if your country is going through a difficult developmental challenge, is it really secure? And at a fundamental level, how does one value or compare the roles of the military versus the police? The police are the face of state authority, state security for the average citizen. They're the ones who interact with the citizens more than anybody else in terms of the security apparatus. And this suggests that the police would generally be well-funded in order to interact effectively with the populace. Sadly, the contrary is the reality in Africa. And let's consider how one effectively deals with the threat of terrorism. That's the thing that's on everyone's mind. Everyone talks about counterterrorism issues. And frankly, countering terrorism, from my experience, and I have a fair bit of it, does not rest with the military. 
It really doesn't. It requires a vigilant intelligence service, a police force engaged with the local community, with a school system that is empowering to young people, with a judiciary that is impartial and just, and with an economy that offers opportunity. So when you look at counterterrorism, you look at countering terrorism, you have to recognize that the success of that effort lies beyond military options. Let's take another approach. Let's consider a constraints analysis of security, somewhat similar to what economic teams do for programs like the Millennium Challenge Compact. You first describe your objective, the image or the definition of what security is or means in your country. So what is security for you? What does that mean? What does it look like? Right? You then consider all the constraints that keep security bound, that keep it restricted, that limit its progress, that keep it from growing. What's holding security back in your country? Is it violence? Is it criminality? Is it economic challenge? Is it jobs? Is it youth unemployment? You will likely find that the real constraints are not the typical things that a military would consider. And here's an American example. Recently, there was much talk and shock over the Trump administration's proposal to cut diplomatic and development funding by one-third. 30% 30 to 37% cuts were being touted by the president. Do you know who were the most vocal critics <laughs> of this proposal? More vocal than the Secretary of State, frankly. The senior leadership of the U.S. military. From their vantage point, the security of the United States required a strong diplomatic presence and an engaged foreign assistance program. They could not do their job effectively without a strong State Department and a strong development agency. I'll give you another example. Let's consider the challenge of piracy, which is a threat to navigation and commerce on both sides of the continent. And just as African navies recognize that greater regional and international cooperation and collaboration is the only effective operational path to interdict pirates, governments are beginning to realize that the solution to piracy begins on land with the pirates and with an understanding of the drivers that make people pirates. Here the solutions tend not to be security military oriented ones, they tend to be developmental, they tend to be community oriented. They tend to look at things like the character of fishing and, and the protection of fisheries, the issues of opportunity. And the solutions, in short, are developmental, environmental, economic, or commercial. And finally, and this is coming down to more practical day-to-day -day effort, finally, militaries and ministries of defense rely on other civilian governmental services, finance, housing, Health, procurement are some of the services that require support from outside the Ministry of Defense. Self-evident. However, if your Ministry of Finance is poorly run or understaffed or corrupt or, God forbid, all three, how do you ensure that your budget requirements, your expenditures, your payroll will be processed effectively? That even the money will be there to do it? And we do know what happens when you don't pay soldiers. If government procurement operations are inefficient and costly, what does it do to your bottom line? All of a sudden, your budget gets more expensive, right? So let's take a step back now. If your government's economic ministries and central bank are struggling against economic conditions or a crisis, what does that mean for your service for your ministry. When your economy is struggling due to a fall in commodity prices, mismanagement, a heavy debt burden, or under an internationally sanctioned austerity program, and frankly, some of these countries here are doing all of those, under all of that stuff, 
What does that mean for your planning purposes? How can you plan when there ain't no money? When your budget can only cover your personnel costs, when 98% of your budget goes to paying salaries, as I know in a few West African countries that is the reality, what does that, how does one enhance security? How do you address that problem? So finally, in order for all of you to develop a commanding understanding of your battle space, I would urge you all to broaden your understanding of what that terrain really is. We all know that militaries and armies win by good logistics, planning. Do you have the resources to do that? But at the same time, if your job is to make sure that your country is secure and you have an internal perspective to it or an external one, you have to ask yourself, is putting soldiers or sailors, Marines forward the way to go? Or should we be looking at getting teachers and you know, people who are dealing with public services and building roads? Is that what's going to make my country more secure? All government agencies operate in an interministerial space where compromise can achieve goals across government. And this is the space that you must understand if you're going to enhance security in a sustainable way. Thank you.